We've seen linear systems in terms of matrices, but they can also take the form of a kth order equation. And what we learned when we did that back in 2D to second order equations applies here too. We have to update things a little bit. A higher order linear equation is really a polynomial operator in one of our two evolution operators, either D in continuous time or E in discrete time. So in continuous time, a kth order equation looks like a linear combination of powers of d. a k times the kth derivative of x with respect to t, plus all the way down the line, set that equal to 0, so that I'm really taking the sum as i goes from 0 to k of some constant a i, times the ith power of the differentiation operator d, all that applied to x equals 0. That's an autonomous kth order differential equation. If we do the same thing with the shift operator, then we get a kth order linear recurrence relation. Solving both of these, really interesting. We're going to see some good examples of these later. Everything in the solution depends on the roots of this polynomial, this characteristic polynomial that is used to define the evolution operator. The general solution to a higher order linear equation is going to be a linear combination of basis solutions. What are the basis solutions? Let's see. Let's start off in continuous time. Let's take our polynomial operator and extract out the characteristic polynomial that is going to be a degree k polynomial in lambda. The nicest possible case is when you have a real root of this characteristic polynomial with multiplicity 1. So lambda is just an isolated root. This eigenvalue, this lambda, contributes exactly one basis solution to the final answer. That basis function is e to the lambda t, just like it was in 2D. Now where it gets interesting is if you have real repeated roots. Let's say that lambda is a root of this polynomial, but with multiplicity j. Then this is going to contribute j different basis solutions. The first one being e to the lambda t, the second one being t e to the lambda t, just like it was in 2D, but now we keep going with higher powers of t out front all the way up until the last one, phi sub j, which is going to be t to the j minus 1, e to the lambda t. Of course, the other case is that of a complex conjugate pair of roots. Let's say that lambda is equal to alpha plus or minus i times beta. This is two roots, and so it contributes two basis solutions to the final linear combination. The first is, just as it was in 2D, e to the alpha t times cosine beta t, and the second is e to the alpha t times sine beta t. The real part gives you the growth, and then the imaginary part gives you the oscillatory component. And that's it, right? No more cases? Well, I'm afraid there is one more case. This is the case where you have complex conjugate roots, but with multiplicity. Let's say that these complex conjugate roots have multiplicity j. There are j pairs of them. This gets a little complicated, but maybe it's not so bad. The first pair is, as we have seen, e to the alpha t times cosine beta t or sine beta t. The next pair gives us a t out front, and then the next pair a t squared out front, all the way up until the last, the jth pair of basis functions is going to be t to the j minus 1 times e to the alpha t, followed by cosine or sine of beta t. That's it. That is all the cases. Now those are the different basis functions in continuous time. How do things change in discrete time? Well, we have a different operator, but the same characteristic polynomial, and we have the same cases that we had before. Basically, this splits up into real and complex. Let's say that we have a real root, lambda, that has multiplicity j. Then the first basis solution, the basis solution if it's a simple eigenvalue, is lambda to the n. 
that's it. That's the same thing that we saw in 2D discrete time. The remaining basis solutions, phi 2 all the way up through phi j, are going to be lambda to the n times increasing powers of n. So phi 2 is n lambda to the n, phi 3 is n squared lambda to the n, all the way up through phi j, which is going to be n to the j minus 1 times lambda to the n. That is a simple pattern that follows what we did both in discrete time 2d and in continuous time arbitrary d just now. In the case where lambda is complex, again with multiplicity j, then what we need to do is convert that to polar form first. We need to express lambda as r e to the i theta, where r is the modulus or the radial component in the complex plane, and theta is the argument or the angular component in the complex plane. Then, in the simple case, with multiplicity 1, our two basis solutions are going to be given by r to the n times cosine n times theta, and r to the n times sine n times theta. Now, if we have complex conjugate roots with higher multiplicity, then what we need to do is take these two basis functions and put increasing powers of n out in front. This matches the pattern that we've seen with real roots and in continuous time as well. Now that looks complicated. It is kind of complicated, but it's also fairly rare. So in summary, if you want to know the solution to your continuous time, discrete time, kth order linear equation, then what you do is you find the roots of the characteristic polynomial, extract the k basis solutions, phi1 up through phi k, and then you can express your solution x as a linear combination of these basis solutions. x is going to be c1 phi1 plus c2 phi2 all the way up through c k phi k, where these constants, the c's, depend on the initial conditions. And I say initial conditions because you're going to need more than one. In 2D, we needed two initial conditions. In a kth order equation, we need k initial conditions to solve for these constants. And that, though it is complicated, is the end of the story of kth order linear equations.